and thank you guys. Thanks, Ange and Manpreet for inviting me. It's um, awesome to be back in Aotearoa and I still feel like I'm always just coming home and which is always fantastic and so great to see some of my old friends and colleagues and students, Andrew. <laughs> so it is great. And thank you, Neil, for um, really kind of segueing from your talk um, into this one. So I'm going to talk about um, how we actually have gone about sort of operationalizing eDNA and um, and where it's sort of sitting now. But I'm also going to, you know, self-indulge and talk about some of my past historic moments, um, just to also show how old I am. So um, my, my PhD was on um, the sheep blowfly. So it was on Lucilia Caprina and I was a fresh little undergrad. I was working at math at the time. Um, out at their Linfield Labs, and I was sitting there d dissecting kiwi fruit um, <laughs> for a market access uh, project, and uh, that's when Rude Kleinpast, who was an entomologist at MAFH, and some of you would know him as the bug man, came excitedly out of his office because they'd actually described that had identified Lucille Caprina as being this, you know, new import into New Zealand. Why this is significant is because Lucilia caprina is one of the many blowflies that are involved in fly strike and fly strike of sheep. And the thing about Lucilia caprina and why everyone was a bit nervous about this new import was because it um, has, or well, had been shown in Australia to have significant levels of insecticide resistance. Whereas the blowflies that were present in New Zealand didn't have that level of organophosphate resistance. And so many of the measures used to control fly strike on sheep were fully effective. So we're very concerned about this new um, species. So I then went, oh, here's an opportunity to do some research. I come from the country, I come from far north in Northland, and um, then my tūranga waiwai is ruai, um, and from a farm. And so I could sort of immediately resonate with this. So I was lucky to get some funding, um, the sheep and wool industry and ag research, um, which was pre-ag research, supported me in this. And so I went to, um, I ended up going to Australia to do my PhD because it was also an organism, a species that I think probably second, at the time, second only to Drosophila in the sense of the level of genomic information that we had back then. And just think, you know, way back then, the type of information that we were dealing with was that we had physical maps um, for these, this species. We had all these different physical mapped strains at CSIRO, and we could do so many amazing basic kind of quantitative genetics, basic um, physical mapping of genes so that I could understand some of the colonisation genetic um, effects post-colonisation in New Zealand. So what did we find? I'm not going to go through all, I'm to go through my PhD, but the main gist of this is that, yes, it definitely came from Australia, it brought organic phosphate resistance with it, but when we did the genetic analysis, we found um, that it came several times and there were several different incursions from different parts of Australia and in fact the genetic diversity within New Zealand increased so it went against what was thought in terms of population bottlenecking because this wasn't single founder effects it was multiple colonizations and that intermixing of those arrivals those um, immigrants into New Zealand brought about um, levels of genetic diversity that were actually really different from what we'd seen in Australia. Now we know that this is a commonplace in New Zealand that we see these occasional and this the occasional occurrences of insects coming over from the Tasman um, some of them not ever establishing. Sheep blowfly definitely did because it had the right host and conditions, but we see these other lovely things that come across. We've got this um, dragonfly, which I've forgotten the name of, but he's beautiful, comes over occasionally. We've got the painted ladies that will start turning up probably around now, around spring, um, blue moon butterflies, they turn up and they're all lovely and they don't really fully establish or cause too much problem. The blue moon butterflies that's been shown to only take about 40 hours to get across from the, um, on the right, um, weather conditions, they can woof across the Tasman in 40 hours, which is pretty amazing. But as we've heard today, also there's some nasty other things that have just recently popped across the Tasman, and um, and we heard about that today with the fall army worm is something that's now recently arrived, and I'm not sure what the status of that, whether, because there was some thoughts that it may not establish, it may not overwinter, but that is a, another newer recursion. And there's plenty of others in that space. 
Um, as Neil alluded to as well, um, that it's, it's, here's the, the species invasion curve. It's a, it's a classic, um, classic diagram to show that, all right, in terms of your area affected versus management costs, um, you kind of want to be working down this end because it's going to be a lot cheaper at the end of the day to be preventing than it is to um, be dealing with something that's in a full-scale, established, widespread and abundant context. So we really want to be working at this end. We want to be working at prevention. We want to be working at, at eradication. And, of course, that comes back to our surveillance and detection. Now, we've heard all the wonderful things about eDNA. Um, so I won't need to go into that at all because um, and this is from um, Ollie Berry, who actually was another PhD student of mine. So um, Ollie's now doing amazing things at CSIRO. Um, and this is a beautiful picture that just sort of shows all the myriad of things that we can do using eDNA technologies. Everything from, you know, measuring biodiversity, things like diet and food webs, things from um, looking at, you know, bees and how they can be used to measure plant biodiversity, looking at environmental change, Change, invasive species, accessing difficult environments, looking at historical environments, because um, I think we're going to hear a bit about that today in terms of sediment cores. Um, so many things, impacts on um, biofouling, industry impacts, and um, obviously then the biomonitoring and biosecurity, so many things. But eDNA is not new, and, and Neil said the same thing as well, so um, I'm going to go back to my time at Manaki Whenua. So at Manaki Whenua, what we would have called it at that time would have been non-invasive species monitoring, which was really eDNA, ultimately. And I saw at that time when I was at Manaki Whenua, so when I finished my PhD at, um, at ANU and CSIRO, I came back to Manaki Whenua um, around 96, and I was there for 14 years. And in that time, I established um, this little offshoot um, ecogene because I could see that there was a real need for getting out there, you know, right from the get-go and putting our research into applied situations. I mean, that's always been about my research. My research has always been focused on getting out there and making a difference because that's kind of the thing that I aspire to, is making a real-world difference. And so we did all sorts of fun stuff. We worked on stoats. <laughs> you remember that, Andrew? <laughs> um, you know, and that was all pretty rudimentary. Like, it was like stoats shoving their heads into um, drain pipes and sticky tape to rip hairs off them so that we could do things like um, look at um, non-invasive methods to be able to genotype them, to be able to look at um, population sizes, individual mark recapture using um, genetics. We did things like, here's our little black-fronted um, fairy terns that were, um, there was issues with predation for these guys and we were swabbing eggshells to find out who the, who the culprits were. And this is actually a native, um, Harrier hawk was the main culprit on nest predation of our fairy terns. And so that was that work that was published. And then um, fun stuff like this, using forensic genetics to look at where did um, this little this guy who was a, a brush-tailed possum that had found itself on a ferry, um, I think it was a barge that had got to um, a tier, so Great Barrier Island, which was a possum-free, um, still is possum-free, is it correct? Yep, that's awesome. This dude was um, found on this barge. There were some scat samples. It was one of those sort of mysteries of who, who did the scat belong to, and so we were able to, to match those things up and, and show that there was no incursion. So we were doing eDNA way back. <laughs> now, it has definitely proliferated, and this is just a recent publication um, that's just looked at quantifying the freshwater um, publications the, and meta-analysis on freshwater publications. Same could be said for many other um, environments to where eDNA has been applied. You can see that um, publication per year has obviously massively ramped up. And the color there, the blue color, is showing that the proportion of these publications that are now actually following really sort of standardized pr approaches, curation of data, making data available, and actually coming together in a more of a uniform approach. So we're starting to see more of that. The other thing, too, that this, this publication showed to, was the... Um, the um, 
type of publication that we're now starting to see. We're seeing some changes. We're seeing less publications in the blue, which was about understanding the ecology of eDNA. And right in the beginning with eDNA, we were all interested in things like, you know, how long does it persist in the environment? How soon after an organism arrives can we detect it? How far does it move? What, what is the effects on the, on the environment, on degradation rates and production rates, things like that? So there's a slight decline in that. There's not really any significance in terms of protocol development and optimization that's still kind of pumping along. But the thing that we're seeing a positive increase in is in biodiversity monitoring. So we're seeing eDNA now shifting from what was kind of a fundamental, like in a bit of a, a bit of an interest, um, to being something that is now a much more applied tool. But we, when we first started, so when I shifted to Australia in 2012, I was lucky enough to receive some funding. Um, I got involved with the Invasive Animal CRC. And eDNA was, you know, sort of still, still seen to being a bit of a novelty, very much freshwater focused. Um, and they were interested in using this as, could we use this in a way of monitoring some of our already established invasive species within Australia? So we were focusing on um, invasive fish species. And our first work, um, and this is with Elise Furlan, this amazing postdoc of mine, was where we looked at all of these things, all of these factors, which is super important now to where we move to when we get to our point around sampling and standardization and detection probabilities. Um, we did all of this stuff, looking at all of these different parameters, and this was also with Richard Duncan was involved in this work. So everything from here's our species, how's our site, how many samples do we need to take, how many replicates we need to do, um, what are all these um, variables that we need to build into our models to be able to um, determine sensitivity? And it is, it comes down to the volume of water, the number of samples, the number of aliquots, proportion of template DNA per aliquot, and also the clumpiness of that DNA in the environment. So that publication was really important because it was a framework from where we can build on how we estimate um, the, the presence of DNA in our surveys. This um, illustrates that quite clearly. Here's our three kind of key um, taxa that we were looking at, which were these established um, invasive species. We've got carp, oriental weather loach, and redfin perch. And you can see the difference in terms of probability of detection in terms of the number of water samples. These were 500 mil water samples that were required in order to achieve a 95% confidence in detection. And you can see the massive difference between sampling and spring versus sampling in autumn. In spring, for all of our three species, you need far less samples to reach that sensitivity than you do in autumn. And that all comes down to the fact that in springtime, everything's warming up, animals are much more active, they're, they're dispersing more um, reproductive material into the environment. There's a lot more DNA from where you can detect. So there's, these are really important factors to when you, you know, in terms of being able to get that quality assurance around your eDNA surveys. I mean, it's all great to go, yeah, we can use eDNA for everything. Well, you need to do a lot of all this basic stuff to be absolutely certain on your, your results. So, but then I was like, okay, we're, we're doing lots of this really cool stuff and I wanted to get us out into the field into a real management practical example right as soon as we could to get a win to show how useful this could be. So this was a project which my PhD student Jonas Bylemans did, and this was looking at the incursion. So we had an incursion front of redfin perch coming into the Lachlan River in New South Wales, um, uh, from the Lachlan River up into Blackney Creek and Urumawalla Creek, into the little headwaters. And this was an incursion of this very nasty, it's a voracious predator, it also has diseases as well, it's not a, not a nice thing incursion onto this cute little um, pygmy perch, um, which there were only two known locations of this little pygmy perch, um, native species. And over time, so there's that, you know, from 2007, 2009, starting to move up, we're starting to see that um, our little pygmy perch is disappearing. Now, they could see this is all going badly. So this was um, the Department of Primary Industries, New South Wales. And what they were wanting to do was to erect a fish barrier, basically put a physical barrier so that redfin perch could not move upstream anymore into the habitat of um, the pygmy perch. So we were lucky enough to be alongside of this while they were out there doing their traditional monitoring, which was um, bait trapping, electrofishing, netting. They were doing all of that. We went alongside them and we did um, our eDNA. 
And then here's what you can see. So the difference between traditional monitoring, so the green dots are um, signifying where red fin perch was present and red were negative from traditional monitoring versus eDNA monitoring. And so you can see that we were able to detect the presence of eDNA from redfin perch much, much further upstream than they did with traditional monitoring. And this is upstream, so there's no flow effect or whatever of, of eDNA. This is where they would have put the fish barrier. This is where they ended up taking the precautionary approach and following the eDNA um, results. And that's where they did put the fish barrier. Here's our fish barrier. And we have gone back every year since, sampled upstream, downstream. We've done metabar coding as well as our, our individual species detections, and we've never found redfin perch above. So to me, I was like, that, that's a really successful thing. Other things that we've been able to do is um, with the carp eradication in Tasmania, working on a really large system. This is about 63 square kilometres is the um, Lake Sorrel where um, European carp is, was found in Tasmania and they have actually got to a point of successful eradication. But the, can we use eDNA in a situation like this? We've got a really large volume. We've got now carp numbers have been driven down. Um, how many samples? will we need to take in order to get a 95% detection probability when our numbers are getting so low? So by doing this sort of modelling approach, by going out and sampling and being able to understand about those variables, we can do things like, all right, for example, with our modelling, if 200 carp remain in Lake Sorrel, you're going to need 7,144, 600 mil eDNA samples of you know, water <laughs> to filter in order to get a detection probability of 95%. But to them, to the Inland Fisheries Service in, in Tasmania, that's actually relatively cheap compared to deploying boats and people and having people located in this environment. So um, that was a paper that Elise um, with um, Richard Duncan and myself and, and Inland Fisheries Services, we published in General Applied Ecology. And um, that, yeah, has been a really interesting one because of that, the, the fact of the scale of what we were dealing with. Okay, so we've moved now from, that was that sort of earlier work and Lately, um, I've been working then with the Invasive Animal CRC, moved into being a centre for Invasive Species Solution. And this um, is a, a research and development partnership arrangement between, you know, universities, government departments, federal, co the, the Commonwealth and the state um, departments. And our next phase of our work has been this operationalising of eDNA, so the, into the in situ point of need. And we've heard about that again, the minion, so minion sequencing for multi-species and using um, the biomeme and the Franklin thermocycler for um, um, single species detections. Again, even this was during COVID, we were lucky enough to um, deal with an incursion. So it was a biosecurity response. It was um, member of the public lovely member of the public phoned in to say that they found some suspicious looking beetles that had come out of the back of a fridge that had just been bought from the good guys, which is like a whiteware um, a company, you know, business that sells um, these sorts of things. And the good guys stores, so they went into lockdown of Fishwick, Belcon and Tugranon and a biosecurity response um, took place. We were there um, immediately sucking up dust. So we had um, modified some like little dust buster vacuum cleaners with some filters, sucking up dust samples using the biomeme in situ. And we, were, we found out that yes, sampling um, our dust samples, which was in the green there, that worked perfectly well. The just, um, and, the, and that's just a side-by-side -side comparison of using the, the biomeme um, with the Quant Studio. Um, so we got, same um, levels of responses, uh, results from those two things and using the two different assays as well. So I think the blue and the green are two different assays and B and C are the um, biomeme versus the, the um, quant studio. So again, um, showing that we can do this directly in the field. At um, pre-border um, biosecurity, this was an interesting one. This is looking at the ornamental fish trade. So fish come into Australia through the ornamental fish trade in these plastic bags. There's a lot of it. It's a big import um, industry, ornamental fish. A lot of escapees can come from the ornamental fish trade. One of the species that we worked on, Oriental weather loach, was an ornamental fish escapee. They can also bring diseases with them as well. 
and often they just looked at the sort of visualized in the bag going oh yeah that looks about right some of the species you could not necessarily tell that well apart some from something something that could be really nasty and invasive versus um, something that's not going to survive as well as um, looking at the health of the, um, the 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 fish coming in so we this was pre-covid just before pre-covid <laughs> we um, sent the team to, to thailand we worked with the um, exporter and they were amazing. Like they're just so into it. They loved doing sequencing. They were like well into it. So we had the, um, the nanopore there and um, returning very much the same results side by side with the Illumina. I won't go into all the nitty gritty detail on that, but other than to say that yes, that worked well and not only was it picking up um, the fish species that we expected to see in terms of DNA, but also um, the, there was um, some detections of gill parasites and some other um, viruses that we would have not otherwise found. However, it's not all plain sailing and sometimes things don't go to plan and you do actually have to, again, do your validations before you go out into the field and then go, oh yeah, I'm, you know, the, the results I'm getting are, are true and correct. So we always, with our work, we're always doing our validations and we will validate within the lab um, where we absolutely can. So red-eared slider turtles is something that pop up as a, as a species that hasn't established in Australia, but they kind of pop up and authorities quickly get in there, um, do their surveillance and try and trap them out and remove them. So they wanted an eDNA point of need site um, assay. They wanted to be able to do the biomeme. They wanted to be able to go out and do this stuff. So we were lucky to grab some um, red-head sliders that, were being, that had been found and we brought them into our facility. We did mesocosm experiments and we showed, yep, validated our field-based um, assay, take you an hour. By the time you get a water sample, just out like something like that out there, and then an hour you've got your result versus our standard um, protocol within the lab. So anyway, we're all good as gold with this. Jack um, Rohan, who's the PhD student on this work, um, he's out there with his, his field kit. Um, there's a pond in Sydney. So this is in um, suburban Sydney in Centennial Park. And I don't know if you can just make out there on the rock. It's one of our little asshole friends. <laughs> okay, there's the asshole. He's on the rock. And um, grab the water sample, can't detect. We fail to detect, or we get really patchy detection. And are there you can physically see them so there's something about reptiles and we know we're not the only ones um, with reptiles that we've found these sorts of difficulties um, however um, in an operation up in Queensland what they were doing in terms of their surveillance they use these basking pontoons so they float these pontoons out this is like from a camera trap this is a Redhead slider um, crawling itself out. Um, there's another one here with our redhead sliders onto the onto the pontoon. So they have camera traps, and so that's fine. But the cameras also get a bit um, stolen occasionally in the field, so that wasn't ideal. And also, there's a lot of time to have to go through footage, and as well as the fact that. With DNA, you can get a lot more. We can get a lot more in terms of obviously the genotypes, the origins, how many individuals, that kind of stuff. So what we said was, all right, let's use these pontoons. Let's put a surface that's a bit rougher so that when they're hauling themselves out, we can go and swab pontoons. So this is what we did. So we did a trial where we had a pond where we knew there were red-head sliders and a pond where um, DAF, uh, the Queensland DAF has said to us, yep, we've got pontoons out there and cameras. There's no red-head sliders. So we did the um, test. So we got Raleigh Road, which is the one where red-head sliders have been seen, 100% from all our samples. Um, the Matthew Road one, we picked up two out of 12 samples, gave a positive detection, and so we were a bit kind of iffy because they were going, no, they're not there, you're wrong, you've obviously got contamination. But sure enough, um, there was a red-head slider there. <laughs> so, there was, so it obviously walked its way from that pond to that pond, and so there was one individual, and we were able to detect that before they could detect it um, physically. So, um, yeah, so I was kind of pretty, pretty pleased with that, that result. Other things that we've been able to do is stuff like obviously Asian black spine toad, which has the potential to be another cane toad in Australia. These things kind of pop up occasionally. They, we see them and they get um, so far have been intercepted. But this one, by using that sort of genomic information and doing phylogenetics, we can find that there was like a couple of quite clear haplotypes. There was definitely an Indonesian haplotype and a everything else. <laughs> 
And so we were able to design then a qPCR assays that could be um, distinguished between the non-Indonesian haplotype probe and have an Indonesian haplotype probe. So that's been really useful in terms of understanding where the risks are in terms of invasions. And we worked with a university in, um, in Indonesia that um, did the actual field experiments for us. Now, our sort of standard um, approaches to establishing assays um, using mitochondrial genes, which tend to always be the, the you know, genes that are the most favorite for us to do this, don't always work. And this is in the case of um, red imported fire ant. This one, um, we've been using, again, dust samples, soil samples, terrestrial samples for this. And we had um, two TACMAN qPCR assays that we developed from um, the CO1 gene region, but we couldn't, with both of those assays, you can see it's pretty messy, can't really distinguish it from other um, ant species that clearly. So um, in this case, what we've done is we've been able to use um, through diversity array technologies, which is co-located with us, so DART, um, using this next generation sequencing approach, we have been able to identify um, presence and absence of specific loci, um, map those loci then back to the whole genome, so using um, the REFA genome that exists, um, test, design the qPCR assays, test then specificity, and then turn that into a much larger scale um, screening process. And you can see here where we've got now mapped back to um, chromosome one. So it's 148, spanning this 148 base pair region of chromosome one. We know where it maps to. And um, now we've got it specific to reefer. And we're now suddenly, we just finished, I think, screening 2,110 shipping containers looking for reefer. So that um, shows again that kind of the power of genomics, the fact that, that if you've got a, a genome, a full genome, you can do this kind of thing and then you're not like left um, not being able to distinguish because often with our, obviously our eDNA fragments are often, they have to be quite short um, is the nature of eDNA and sometimes obviously your, your mitochondrial genes aren't gonna do it for you. But for me, the most exciting things is seeing this, seeing our biosecurity officers out there sucking up dust samples from shipping containers and <laughs> really enjoying kind of being part of this and building up these really amazing pictures from this data, which I'm really, you know, um, super proud of. And so this is like we, we, we do combinations of, of our species specific assays versus our, as well as our um, meta barcoding assay, so multi-species so that we, we're going in with universal primers so that we're picking up, you know, the sort of the hitchhikers as well as these really targeted high risk species. So here's an example from one of these targeted high risk species. So this is brown marmoranted stink, stink bug. And we've got all this amazing data behind us, which um, the federal government has supplied us. Um, where we've got, we know where all our shipping containers are from, or coming from, um, the container event counts through to container counts, um, possibly carrying BMSB in terms of a risk because of the, the con contents of those containers. Um, we've got all of these counts, we move them to this point where we're doing our eDNA and eRNA because we also do RNA assays because RNA can tell us whether something is likely to be potentially still alive. So DNA is one thing because it can pick up, you know, fragments of stuff, but they may not be alive. Whereas the RNA fragments can tell us that there's potential for something still to be living. So in this case, with this um, BMSB, we had uh, um, an eDNA positive rate of 0.8%. We had an eRNA positive rate of 0.4%. And what was interesting in this too is that um, it can tell us things like, uh, you know, if we look at what the risk profiles are of these shipping containers, and it may not be necessarily the point of origin of the shipping container, but more the, the products inside or the packaging of the products, which is what we've actually found with Capra Beetle. It's more about the packaging than it is the container itself. Now, with these um, eRNA results, similarly with Capra Beetle, we've sent biosecurity officers back into those containers and they have found you know, wriggling larvae of capra beetle because of this. So as a consequence, and how we can build up these pictures and how we can really start to inform risk on a really large scale, um, we have been established now um, by the, the Australian government as Australia's national eDNA reference centre. 
So what we now do as a reference centre, so the team, the Eco DNA team, which is my, my research team, um, we've been formalised, formally recognised as the Australian National eDNA Reference Centre. Um, this was by what was the, the mega department at the time, pre-election, it's now split into two departments, but same thing, we're kind of still sitting under that. But this has been formed by, through policy. So it's an actually, we now sit in policy. So if we're talking about, you know, Neil, when um, we're discussing about how you go about actually getting this stuff to work, you need to have, you need to have those advocates within government that are going to make change for you. They're going to push for you. They're going to understand the technology, but they're going to be able to write it into policy documents, which means that you are going to be able to function. You're going to be able to input into these really kind of significant, um, you know, potentially quite, um, you know, major change, change um, technologies. So what we do is we develop and validate those e DNA and RNA um, assays and um, protocols and we follow international standards for that so we are following ISO standards the other thing that the government did was work with NATA which is the national accrediting authority in Australia that accredits those ISO 17025 facilities which are those diagnostic facilities on international standard IANS is the accrediting facility here then we also offer proficiency testing schemes for other collaborating labs. So we're now working with a number of labs in Australia. Um, and then our other role is to continue testing these sort of more cutting edge technologies um, to complement and improve the surveillance and monitoring because as we know, the technology continues to increase. So here we are working with um, a bunch of labs around Australia that have become the collaborating centres. And so it is a really great network of um, labs working together, um, all, as I say, singing from the same song sheet. And in that, we've all worked together in developing these standards, guidelines, protocols. So we now have these documents which are free to download. So make use of these. We have the Environmental DNA Protocol Development Guide for Biomonitoring. We also have an Environmental DNA Test Validation Guidelines. This was with um, a collaboration of 50 researchers all coming together across Australia and New Zealand. Um, we've got, we had input from New Zealand with Hawthorne Institute heavily involved and um, Wilder Lab through Sean Wilkinson. So this is all well and good, but we also need reference databases and that's the same everywhere. And I think if we can all be uniformly working together on, on reference databases and pulling resources where we can, that would be an amazing thing to advance this. Um, CSIRO have invested heavily um, along with the government and they're developing now this National Biodiversity DNA Library and that is underpinned by, by Platforms Australia which is an infrastructure that enables um, significant amount of sequencing resources and then there's the Atlas of Living Australia which um, of course Neil um, pointed to as well and the Atlas of Living Australia can give you a whole lot of other biological information so all these things kind of coming together working together I think we can really make a push and really make a, a real operational difference in terms of um, biosecurity and managing invasive species into Australia. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that um, because just the, the power I think of eDNA I, th I don't think we can um, you know, like emphasize it enough. I think there's just so much that we can gain from using this technology. This is just one thing, but um, it was a paper that just came out recently, which I just felt that really emphasized this and I thought was amazing. This has just come out from um, University of Florida. It's in molecular ecology resources. This is a really cool one because this is looking at um, sea turtles. It's genomics of sea turtle species. And this is using population genetics um, from sand eDNA. So we've got, um, they had, they found like these turtles that were nesting in these nest chambers. They crawl out, they, and the hatchlings crawl down to the ocean. But from all of this eDNA that can be collected from the water, from the sand, from the um, oviposition sites, there's so much information using both, um, so things like haplotypes, microsatellites to do their population genetics. They can use then the eDNA from the water to look at things like population range and abundance. So there's so much information um, that can be gained from these environmental samples that if you were to kind of obtain that information through sort of traditional kind of, you know, ecological means, that's a lot of resources into doing that. The power of this is really amazing. It just blows me away. The fact that you can do all of these things and not only with a 
this is about the turtle, but there was all associated pathogens as well um, that they were learning about from the study. So it's an amazing, I thought it was a really awesome study. It's just come out. And um, like anything, it's the, the team, um, wonderful collaborators. Um, yeah, we've been we're really, really fortunate with the collaboration that we've had. Definitely the Australian government has been behind us. And again, that comes down to the advocates that we've had within the Australian government. And I really appreciate everything that they've done for us. And um, yeah, just sort of shout out to the team, obviously postdocs, PhD students, I don't do anything anymore. I just, um, yeah, I don't know what I do. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that is that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Di, that was awesome. Um, just want to open it up for any questions and remind anybody who's on Zoom that if they want, they can just unmute and just ask away. Thanks, Di, really great. This is a biodiversity monitoring question. So where are we in terms of being able to go to a site and taking all this eDNA information that you're talking about and making some summary statement about ecological health, ecological integrity, you know, like after restoration, after we've done all this restoration, now now this is our condition in, in total. Yeah, look, I mean, I think it is always comes back to the benchmarking and like, do you have a reference to go back to, to be able to compare? So, but I do think we are definitely in a position to be able to piece together, you know, what the environment looks like just from a, a DNA fingerprint from that environment. And I think nothing's shown it even more than um, the Cawthorn Institute's um, Lakes 380 project. I think that's been an amazing project of showing that sort of reconstruction of what the environment looks like or looked like in history, but also giving a picture to the future of what that could look like post restoration based on those DNA signatures and showing that Okay, in, the, in those cases of that Lakes 380 project where you've got, um, you can pinpoint over time of when an invasive species come in and how that's really, you know, changed the community. So we are definitely at that stage of being able to do this sort of full community analysis and we should be taking advantage of it. <laughs> Um, I was really interested with your RNA testing. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that that was on the cards. Mm -hmm. um, have you had much trouble, because you know, RNA is famously delicate and fragile, yes. degrades fast. Yep. Is that an issue you've come up across? No, not if you can handle the samples um, quickly and be able to put um, you know, your RNA later onto them as soon as possible. So we'll, you know, once our um, people are in there sucking up dust, they, you're preserving it as quickly as possible, getting it to us as fast as possible as well, yeah. But that's the beauty of doing stuff on site. You know, so where we are on site, that's, you know, that is definitely where we want to be, you know, to do the work there, because then it saves all of that. Um, this is just a bit of a general question that you don't feel like you have to know the answer to. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've seen a couple of times now about the fact that eDNA has been around for a while, but it's had this really recent, you know, massive mm. upsurge. What do you think is the driver behind that? The upsurge? Well, I think it's because um, we've just gotten better at uh, being able to get DNA from the environment. I think it's just more the understanding that, you know, it's moved from that sort of metagenomics of soil I mean, those guys have been doing it for ages. But I think then once it got moved out into other environments and we could just sort of open up people's eyes to all the amazing other things that could be done, then I think everyone's just kind of run with it. But um, but I, I sort of attribute a lot of it back to, um, it was actually Lindsay Chatterton, who was a Department of Conservation scientist here in New Zealand. He went to um, the Nature Conservancy in the US and worked with um, these people out of University of Notre Dame. And the first real kind of big project was that um, Asian carp uh, incursions into the Great Lakes. And it was Lindsay who was the one that really sort of went, hey, he'd seen some stuff on maybe filtering, you know, DNA. And he went, let's, you know, let's try it in this situation. And that really kind of kicked things off and then got everyone's interests a bit more peaked and particularly when it came to invasive species. But yeah, and I think, you know, I, th I think we've sort of seen that through some other projects that have really captured everyone's imagination much more. Mm. <laughs> Getting your exercise. Um, so you and Neil mentioned a lot of uh, different databases, um, 
And I'm just wondering, because the output of the experiment would be heavily dependent on what's in the database. And mm -hmm. does GenBank, for instance, gather all these different, what's, what's the best database to uh yeah, no. I mean, like, I mean, GenBank is your kind of, um, if you had to, if you have to. Um, the, the issues with GenBank is some of the, you know, it's not, it's not super reliable. The representation is um, quite skewed, and particularly when you are, you know, working within these sorts of um, environments where you've got, you know, other species that are just going to be missing um, from GenBank because it is very patchy. And I think it is about the uniformity of what we're after, about also the diversity of gene regions. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a, you know, plethora of like 12S, for example, you know, for many organisms, but there's huge gaps that exist and, and specifically in areas that have got more unique taxa. So yeah, for the, for the, you know, common stuff, but even then there's a lot of, not well curated stuff in there. <laughs> any, any advice for the best? Uh, I guess it depends on the on the model. Or what you're looking it for. depends on the you know the group that you're working with, um, and you know whether you know you create your own database. You either pull stuff down from from NCBI and you just go right, okay, well that's what it is what it is, and and work within the limitations of that. It's really going to be very dependent on on the groups that you're working with. for one more <laughs> thanks very much for your presentation um, very uh, interesting she I just started my uh, new position in MPI my project gonna be eDNA mm -hmm. so it's very interesting this presentation Fantastic. Um, I'm just wondering uh, actually in your presentation you talk uh, you show some slide that you are able to detect very low density of the target. I'm mm -hmm. um, just wondering how the limit of detections that you got to now. Yeah, like less than ten counts or even yes, one. Yes, yes, really? less than. Yeah, we can go oh, down less. It's, it's really going to depend on performance of assays, and there are sort of the minimum standards um, that you know that I think we all kind of adhere to on terms of how assay performance should be. But you do need to take that into account. Not all assays perform in that way. So not everything is, you know, you, you're comparing apples with apples. So you, you do have to be mindful of that. Whenever you look at publications, look at their limits of detection, look at, you know, have they validated that? And that can tell you about how well things perform because not all assays are the same and, and things that we would, that's why we will always trial them. Like the red-head sliders, um, those assays were developed internationally, but we pull them into Australia. We, we work with them and they just, they have not performed at the level that we need them to be. They might, they're fine in a mesocosm when you've got tons of you know abundance of dna yes. but you take it out into these settings and that's the stuff you've got to really be you know um sure about in in a setting particularly for for biosecurity when you're counting your your positives or your zeros more to the point so failing to detect doesn't necessarily mean that you know it's not there <laughs> but you need yeah. to have some quantitative approach and so so one of the, your slide uh, you said that because Illumina and Nanopore actually give very similar results, which is very interesting. It is. It's amazing. It is really, really good. Um, I would say, you know, read depth, you know, does differ, obviously. The Illumina um, would be a lot cheaper, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look, that, that it's getting, everything's getting cheaper, which is really good. But you just have to be, and I think doing sort of, always have a gold standard that you need to go back to compare to. I think it's great having these things that we deploy out in the field, but you really do need to always have that gold standard um, yeah. back to some sort of, you know, um, facility so that you can validate. And so Illumina must be more sensitive than... Uh, it is more in terms yeah. of read depth. It gets very yes. a short sequence. Yes, and sometimes, um, you know, there, there's a, there is error rate, there's a higher error rate in the nanopore, but it is getting less problematic you can overcome yeah. it by having more reads. I'm worried about the singleton that is producing Illumina. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You need to have your thresholds. <laughs> but we yes. can talk more about that. But yes, yeah, yes. Um, check out the, the yeah. guidelines. I'll catch yeah. up with you later. Definitely. <laughs> Sweet. I think we're going to have to call it there just to keep on time. Oh, is there one on the... Oh, oh yeah, one for you on the screen. Uh, in the future, will you be able to quantify abundances? Oh, is this Phil Sherwin? <laughs> fantastic <laughs> um yes and i think look for some things we've been able to do that and and um for some systems there has been um some studies where they have been able to get good 
you know, abundances in the sense of biomass um, versus the, our eDNA detections. But again, I'm always a little cautious to say that because I think, you know, again, every different organism has different rates of production, it often has different, um, it depends on the gene regions as well, like mitochondrial DNA, like you're going to get different ratios of um, signatures of different areas of genomes just on what's happening with the species at a particular time. I mean, like, for example, at spawning time, you'll get a higher ratio of nuclear DNA than you will mitochondrial DNA. So you really have to be mindful of, you know, what it is that you're looking at and then how that relates to the organism that you're dealing with. But there have been quite a few studies that have shown that, you know, there's a real good correlation between biomass and eDNA if you take those factors into account. 